Episode 55 is titled Midnight Sun, referencing the natural phenomena that occurs in the Arctic and Antarctic circles when the sun remains visible even during nighttime. This episode is about saving a dream, about trying to hold on to hope even in the most hopeless of situations. It is an episode about finding that beacon of light in the darkest of nights. Levi is forced into a choice. His and humanity's greatest commander, the only person he could rely on to just not die. Or the next generation. A boy with that same spark in his eyes that his commander once had, the same selfless drive that brought them further than they could have ever imagined. This will be a story about hope and the triumph over adversity, of the light never going out even as night falls, and even if their very life is snuffled out. And in a more abstract sense, while it is very much a real phenomena, I think the term of midnight sun itself immediately evokes this sense of surreal wonder. Juxtaposing midnight, something you'd typically associate with the darkness, and the sun, something you'd typically associate with light, immediately paints this image of a flickering torch in the night, as if you finally found this place of respite in the shifting horrors of midnight. And in an even more abstract sense, the people living in the polar circles where the phenomenon actually occurs are, one, on average, probably a lot more hardened than the average person since, well, um, the Arctic, and two, their life is governed by these celestial events that a majority of the world can't even picture. Both of these things are kinda true for parody as well. They are a small secluded island governed by surreal pseudo-celestial forces that are the paths. The natural sort of climate of their island is also something that doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet. I mean, no one else is really being attacked by titans like 24-7. And if you really, really want to overanalyze, there is also the time dimension. The paths transcend time, and in a way, so does the midnight sun, because, well, midnight. Armin's body would be rebuilt within the paths, and he is the sun in the midnight that is this episode. From a structural point of view, this episode is also a pretty radical departure from the established formula. There is no cold open, no intro sequence of any kind. We open on just this quiet frame of Attack on Titan Season 3, and that is it. There is no narration, because the narrator of the story is currently comatose. For a vast majority of this episode, there is no music because this is a gap in Armin's story that he tells the world. The tracks we see in the series are guiding tracks. They are meant to convey some sort of emotion and contextualize the events we see on screen. But in this episode, it is purposely a blank slate. We, the viewers, the ones sort of hearing Armin's tale after all of it is said and done, are meant to decide how we actually feel about the events that transpire. It's almost like a stage play where the primary drama, action, and emotion comes from just dialogue and that is it. It's definitely not the first time we've had this much slower and much more personal narrative, but I don't think it's a stretch to say that this one takes that to its most extreme. Right up until the end of the episode, there is never any sort of explosive moment in the music or whatever else. The silence throughout is deafening and the pressure you feel, even on a 10th rewatch, is nothing short of excellence. But finally moving into the episode, we pick up moments after the previous one, with Aaron just saying he had a feeling that this would happen, then asking why doesn't he ever just run away? In this instance, that is in reference to him not letting go of Barbershop and the little flashback of the bullies we saw last time. But in the long run, this is a question we'd see asked again multiple times. There is Armin leaping up to protect Mikasa, fully knowing that Aaron would beat him up just like everyone else before. And if we jump to the very, very end, it is again Armin facing down Eren's founding slash doomsday titan. Just like we saw last time, he might get beaten, he might be humiliated, but he will never back down. But almost right away, we see Peak show up. Eren grabs Burrito as a hostage, and we get another classic close-up of Eren's eyes with that almost pads-like pattern as Zeke recognizes first his titan markings and, by extension, him. The presence of the Titan markings, or rather lack thereof, is something we've talked plenty about with Aaron's first transformations. This is the scene that we were talking about way back in the Season 1 days, and one that creates a teeny tiny plot hole. Like I said in the Season 1 days, there are a lot of stories where these magical things, they aren't actually visible in-universe. A ton of those magical effects are sort of visual just so that we as the audience see them, but in reality, the characters don't see them. The markings, on the other hand, are actually real. So Eren not having those, while people like Armin and far later Falco immediately have them even after their first transformations, just seems like a bit of an oversight. That aside though, connecting the dots that the only person this titan shifter could be is Eren, Zeke mutters that he looks nothing like his father. Eren's progression from looking like his mom and that precious boy just special to be born, 
to eventually looking just like his hateful father with, as Keith described, those dagger in his eyes, is something that is noted very explicitly by Zeke himself. And funnily enough, even though Zeke himself acknowledges that, he doesn't realize that Aaron's plan is largely Grisha's. They are not collaborating, even though he thinks they are. But if you are an over-analysis enjoyer, it naturally brings up the question of why do they look so similar? Hey Vsauce, Michael here. We know that the collective memories of the Founding Titans just become this soup existing at all points in time. So could this resemblance between him, Grisha, and even Yuri be an outcome of that? Frida's hairstyle, who, by the way, also very explicitly sees Aaron in the mirror, also seems to be styled after Mikasa's long hair. So maybe these perceptions of self just bleed through time? Aaron's entire dream was so that his friends and Mikasa never have to fight. The reason he told her to cut her hair is so that it doesn't get tangled in the ODM gear. So in allowing Frida to have the long hair, perhaps that is his way of doing that? Oh. I don't know what that means. Though Zeke then just asks to believe him, saying he knows what he's been through, that both of them are victims of that man, and that Aaron has been brainwashed by his father. Through both the similarities between Zeke and Grisha were given here, as well as the pointy ears, as well as what Zeke says here, this pretty blatantly confirms that, yeah, they are related. And on top of that, we've already seen the Grisha flashback and him just showing up outside of the walls. And combining that with the people beyond the walls having much more advanced technology and Grisha being a wonders doctor, well, Zeke does kinda do a light reveal of Marley and the entire Grisha dynamic here already. Fun fact though, when the series was still coming out, this is where I had a bunch of insane tinfoil theories that parody is just a massive testbed for weird genetic engineering and that Grisha is just someone who escaped the simulation slash program if you will. I mean, it makes sense, it's like a weird secluded island of titans and then suddenly there are people with much more advanced technology coming over here to get him. I mean, come on, it makes sense, right? Nostalgia aside, Zeke notices Levi, whose aura is all capital letters, MAD. Is he even conscious? Is he still pursuing Zeke? Or is this just some primal survival mechanism of just climbing up the wall? Well, we know it's pursuing Zeke, but he looks absolutely monstrous here, to the point that it's hard to tell whether when he slips down the wall, that is actually purposeful. And speaking of, this is also one of very few times where the dub adds an entirely new line that is not even there in the original. What a monster. I was very curious as to why it's there, but as it turns out, this is actually a manga line that was cut for the anime, but then the dub team seemingly wanted to add it back, so they put it back in. It's very cheeky, because you never actually see anyone speaking, it's a cutaway to Levi, so if you didn't know it was there, well, you'd never know. And I guess if I've brought up the manga, another fun fact, the cart's initial design changed drastically over the course of Return to Shiganshina. Like, look at it. It looks like a creepy old man. Probably because Peak didn't exist and it actually was an old man. Yeah, seriously. Imagine what the thirsty boys and girls would be doing if Peak never existed. It'd be a tragedy greater than Attack on Titan itself. As for why Isayama changed the cart's design to, like, having a very, very long nose and that magically being Peak, I've got no idea. The old dude just looks like the old dude. Why does Peak look like this? Well, I guess we'll never know. Goofs aside though, Levi finally lands on the roof, asking for blades and gas. But in that same moment, Armin coughs and we hit the title card. That cough is Midnight Sun, the small spark of life in the darkness all around them. We then hop on over to Hanji's side, with them bandaging each other up and interrogating Reiner about the weird metal case that we now know is housing Amir's letter. This is where I goofed up a little bit, because I assumed that in that brief little flashback scene, Reiner was just doing the dedicate your heart salute while mentioning Amir. Admittedly though, it does make a whole lot more sense that he is actually just going to touch the actual letter itself. That said, I still don't think it actually changes anything about what I said. Be it from a in-universe sense, or more so a meta one, I think putting a letter there of all places is meant to deliberately evoke the salutes. But yes, really, it is the letter, so I just got a little bit lost in the sauce there. It happens, that's why I call this overanalyzing. But anyway, the most important thing here is Hanji saying that he was still trying to reach for it, even as his legs and arms were being chopped off. Despite the, you know, big betrayal in him trying to wipe everyone out, this very much tracks with the dependable Reiner we've heard so much about. In the grand scheme of things, the letter is completely and utterly meaningless. This is a war in which Marley aims to wipe out parody as a whole, but even so, he aims to fulfill that promise. Maybe it is because he himself, or at least the soldier Reiner, is crushing on Astoria. Or maybe it is just 100% for Emir. But point is, even now, he tried honoring that promise. 
Just like we saw with Burrito and the whole you are not devils and I consider you as friends thing, it humanizes Reiner while also accentuating the ever-present question of why is all of this even happening if even the attackers think this is bad? And another nice bit of consistency is Reiner still using the name Krista and not her actual name of Historia. Though with Reiner reaffirming that he's not going to tell them anything, Hanji says that the only choice they have is, well, to skadoosh him. But before they can do that, Jean screams out saying that they might be able to steal his power. Jean's leniency when it comes to the Marley squad, and really his allies in general, is something that will be a really interesting point of friction moving forward, because fact of the matter is, being lenient will always put you in a if not lose-lose situation then at least a very very tough one. Killing Reiner, regardless of what happens next, can never really be classified as a mistake. Sure, they lost a Titan Shifter and they didn't capture his power. But at the same time, they completely removed that variable from the battlefield outright. By all accounts, it is the safest option. By bargaining with him and potentially trying to recapture the Titan, however, exactly as we'd see, well, you open yourself up to a bunch of failures, which in hindsight, absolutely will seem like a mistake. It's one of those situations where if you succeed, of course you'll be a genius, but if you fail, well then you'll be like the worst thing ever. And as is always the case with Isayama, this perspective would of course be very neatly contrasted by none other than Flock. Unlike Jean, who'd constantly question his decisions and constantly feel that insecurity, Flock would be blindly bullish, often completely ignoring any and all nuance. More on the Circle Saw Hair Man later, but Hanji says that they don't know if there's anyone to save with the syringe. They don't know where Levi is, whether or not he's even alive, whether the syringe is still intact, and like a dozen other variables, saying we've been caught out enough times as is. And the interesting thing here is Jean realizing that Hanji is just angry and not really thinking straight. And so, he just asks, how can we ever win if we never learn? This entire Jean-Hanji debate explores two directly opposing sides of what is basically the same emotional turmoil. Jean is asking whether or not he still feels some level of camaraderie with Reiner, whether this hesitation is actually emotional rather than rational. Hanji, on the other hand, is seeking vengeance and only then asking whether that vengeance is indeed rational. Like we just talked about, there is a very good argument to be made that killing Reiner is the right call. But in the same vein, Jean too is absolutely right in saying that he'd be a massive asset. Jean's growth throughout the series is something that I think a whole lot of people really, really sleep on. You fully expect Armin to always be the one looking to negotiate. But in just a couple of episodes, Jean swings from that stop hesitating and let's blow them sky high to reason because they have the upper hand. Obviously, this is a far cry from what we saw in Season 1. He is extremely cautious, but he is never overzealous in that caution. Eventually, though, they land on the compromise of Mikasa going to find Levi and firing off a flare as soon as they've confirmed that someone else is going to get the syringe. At which point, Ol' Reiner will taste a good ol' ODM gear blade. And again, we see that dynamic continued, with Hanji saying, It was my decision. Your input just helped. We've seen just how dangerous and explosive Hanji can be when angry. But at the same time, everything Jean said is valid. So weighing the pros and cons of every outcome, Hanji puts aside the rage of losing Moblitz and explicitly states that it is not Jean's decision to bear, which also may or may not be a callback to Erwin already picking Hanji as the next commander. Obviously, they don't know that Erwin is, well, not dead, but like almost dead. But in the bigger narrative, it very much makes sense. A leader is responsible for their squad, right? And so, Hanji immediately tells Jean to stop questioning himself because regardless of the results, his feelings and thoughts on the matter will be irrelevant, as it was never his command to give. And we then get to absolute cinema, as the episode just smash cuts to Mikasa crying and holding onto her head as Eren screams that Armin is still breathing. And also tiny detail, note that there are three blank frames right as we cut to Mikasa. An in-universe interpretation is all the Emir stuff which we'll get to in a second. But I think from a purely directional point of view, those three blank frames in between that you're probably not really going to catch, just almost subliminally puts you in this weird headspace of what did I miss? What is going on? Why did everything just cut out for a second? A very, very, very subtle thing that, in my opinion, is super effective in conveying this messed up headspace that we're about to get to. Considering the sheer emotional weight of potentially losing someone as close to her as Armin, I think the whole headache thing here is, again, just Emir peeking through, just like we saw with the death of Aaron's mom, or when Aaron was captured, and so on. In each and every one of those moments, I think it's just Emir wanting to see and feel such strong emotions of love. That aside though, the direction here is just beautiful. 
As soon as we cut to them atop the rooftop, which is a whole emotion bomb in and of itself, Mikasa immediately fires off the red flare, signaling they have the syringe and to skadoo Reiner. But moments after that, Peak shows up behind Hanji and gobbles up Reiner. It's such an insane cascade of events that is not dramatized, there is no music, it just happens, and you're just kind of left asking, what? what happens next? Could Midnight Sun be referring to the Titans all rejoining the battle? Is that the midnight we are dreading, not the potential death of Erwin and Norman? So yeah, if last episode we brought down all three of the enemy shifters, then this episode, well, we immediately lose two of them. Can you imagine an alternate scenario where Parody actually captures the Beast and the Armored here? Well, I guess it wouldn't actually matter because, you know, the Founding Titan and the Rumbling, but still fun to think about. Returning to Levi, though, we get this absolutely beautiful shot of his bloodstained hand giving the syringe to Aaron. It does seem mildly evocative of the creation of Adam, but this sort of reaching out shot is extremely common, even in Attack on Titan itself, it is used to, like, contrast Reiner's betrayal. But point being that, whatever it's supposed to evoke, it is a really cool shot that also embodies that guilt of handing over the syringe. The blood here is obviously Zeke's, but as we'll see in a second, this decision for Levi is not about who he will save, but rather who he won't. Once again, his hands would be drenched in the blood of his own allies, and so that is what we see here. And speaking of, suddenly Flock appears with Erwin, prompting Levi to immediately pull back the syringe. And again, note that Zeke's blood still has not evaporated off of him. This entire decision is making Levi feel unclean, which, as we know, is his nightmare scenario. Regardless of what he picks, someone will die at his hand, and so that blood remains. With every single action, every single word he says, he is unclean, he is covered in blood. Aaron is dumbfounded, just muttering, Captain? And exactly as with Aaron and Armin, Levi just says, he's still breathing. We've already seen a version of this with Mikasa listening for Eren's heartbeat, but I'm a huge sucker of these super simple, almost primal scenes of just checking for a basic sign of life. It's just this super powerful moment where all moral complexity is thrown aside, all lore is thrown aside, and the only question that remains is a very, very simple, are they still breathing? 10 out of 10, perfect, no notes. Though as Levi now refuses to give up the syringe, the gears begin turning in Eren's mind. A deep hum, the first track of this entire episode, finally creeping in. Aaron's emotions are becoming turbulent. It is no longer desperation about just injecting Armin. Rage slowly begins to bubble to the surface. And in the larger story, you could also interpret this as Armin's story growing turbulence. Like we talked about at the start of the episode, this episode doesn't have all the usual parts of narration, guiding tracks, and so on. So with this part of Armin's story involving Erwin's life being sacrificed for him, I think you can also interpret it as him having a hard time talking about it. For the rest of the series, we would see just how insecure he is about this choice. He doesn't feel worthy of Erwin's sacrifice. That is why the previous episode is titled just Hero. Armin leaps into the fire so as to sacrifice himself and no one else. But here, that decision to become that hero, to sacrifice himself, is ripped away from him. And if you wish to overanalyze even further, with how much the story of Attack on Titan explores free will and the question of bodily autonomy when it comes to the Titan Shifters, Armin being pulled back from the edge of that sacrifice is yet another form of those same themes. He willingly chose to die, but his free will was taken away. Aaron screams just saying, Levi told him that they'd inject Armin. But with Erwin now entering the picture, he just mutters that he's giving it to Erwin, the person who can actually save humanity. And what I absolutely adore here is how in that same moment, Mikasa immediately draws her sword. Her sword hand is shaking as she stares on in disbelief. Her mind is almost refusing what she's hearing, but her hand is 100% ready to cut down Levi here and now. At this very moment, the only thing that matters to her is Armin. Anyone standing in her way could very, very easily get the Ackerman treatment. But okay, let's take one final breather, because we then hop on over to the mid-card, going over all the conditions Erwin laid out for using the syringe. One thing that has constantly bugged me, though, is the question of what happens if you give the syringe to a barely alive Titan Shifter? As in, using it like a health potion. We of course know the Titan Shifters can transform while being severely injured, but for some reason, when transforming into a pure Titan, people just magically heal. So, the question arises of, 
what if a Titan Shifter just pokes themselves with the syringe? They're not going to become a normal Titan because they're already a Shifter. So, can you just like use them as a health potion? The closest thing that we've seen to this is Aaron gobbling up the armored vial, but again, like we talked about with Rod, that's not an injection, it kind of seems to work differently. And we know that Annie was also experimented on a whole bunch, but we've never actually seen, like, a direct injection. This is why you don't want me doing your Titan science. Returning to the episode though, Levi is very blunt, just asking, do you have the faintest clue what you're doing? You want to let Erwin, the commander of the Survey Corp, to die without lifting a finger? And note how he frames this. To him, this is not a matter of who he will save, it is a matter of who he will leave to die. This is something that he has gone through many, many times before. Is that helplessness in the face of death that just tears him apart because he always survives. Over and over again, it is everyone else that ends up dead. But not Erwin. Just like him, Erwin always seemed to survive. And on that note, as with any good human drama, it is time for some massive hypocrisy. Aaron calls out Levi saying they agreed to give it to Armin. Levi, however, tells him to set aside his emotions, to which Aaron immediately fires back asking, Emotions? Why did you hesitate to give me the syringe earlier? Effectively just saying, your entire he's our commander thing is complete b <laughs> The one bogged down by emotions is actually him. Had he truly been rational, they would have injected Armin in an instant. I mean, he was barely clinging on to life as is and has already proven to be extremely valuable. And so, Levi admits that, yeah, he was thinking about how Erwin could be alive. To which Erwin again fires back saying, you could have never known that Flock would have carried him here. So basically, Erwin is saying that, regardless of what the outcome is, Levi has been unreasonable. While Levi was stalling for some magical hope that somehow, someway Erwin would arrive, Armin could have already died, and in the end, the only unreasonable one, the only emotional one, would have been Levi. Realizing that there is no arguing with Aaron, Levi punches him out of the way, only for Mikasa to knock him to the ground and quickly realize that he is much weaker than usual. Personally, I think this is where Levi's mind actually shifts from purely reactionary to much more thoughtful. He doesn't resist, instead proposing a very rational argument of, without Erwin, we can't win. Levi knows full well that he needs Aaron and Mikasa's support, even if, and that is a very very big if, he could overpower Mikasa and forcefully inject Erwin. If Aaron and Mikasa both go berserk on him, well, this whole thing would go up in smoke. To a certain extent, Levi never had a chance here. Sure, they'll revive Erwin and the scouts will be back in full force, except why would Aaron bother going to the sea? Why would Mikasa bother doing anything when the only thing Aaron is doing is probably bawling his eyes out? Just like Hanna said, things can never go back to the way they used to be unless all three of them are together. Without Armin, that's it. Those dreams, they are dead. But responding to Levi's arguments, Aaron turns right around and says, it's the same with Armin. He's the reason they blocked off Trost. He's the one who uncovered Annie. He's the one who proposed traveling at night. He's the reason they found Reiner. And he's the one who brought down the Colossal then just screaming that it is neither Erwin nor him that are humanity's saviors. It's Armin. We've talked at length about all the armin Erwin parallels throughout the season and even beyond. Even things like him standing against Captain Warman in like season 1 are very very erwin like But point is, it is very very hard to say which one of them is the better commander. Not commander, Erwin's the better commander, but I don't have a better word for that. Armin's like not really a commander because he's not a hype man, but Erwin is a commander because he's very much a hype man, but you like get the idea, like a leader and like a strategist, sort of like rolled into one, that's sort of a commander, but Armin's not really a commander. You get the idea. Especially considering that Armin has a lot more personal information on the Marley squad. In episode 50, I made this little chart here which I think summarizes the idea quite well. Erwin has leadership and charisma like no one else. But Armin's borderline impossibly specific insights are also unrivaled. Even in the same episode 50, both Erwin and Levi were both like, yeah, Armin's cooking. And in terms of long-term prospects, would Erwin be able to make peace with the outside world? Armin was always, without exception, negotiate first. Erwin, on the other hand, always found leverage and only then worked backward. Ignoring the whole fixed timeline stuff, I know some people have wildly claimed that Erwin would have sided with Eren, which to me makes literally zero sense. But that's a whole different topic that I might make a video on if you want me to. Erwin versus Armin is not a simple choice no matter how much you like the greatest hype man or the worst haircuts. 
Without devolving to some meaningless headcanon of, well, Erwin was such a good leader, they would have wiped the floor in Liberio, yada yada, when looking at purely their achievements side by side, it is not an easy decision. But then, the wannabe veteran starts spouting about how no one survived on the other side of the wall, saying he thought he'd die, but Erwin was the only one who thought otherwise. Even in that bleak situation, he came up with a plan to defeat the Beast Titan. And it worked. First off, Mikasa just immediately telling him to shut up is gold. Erwin's our leader. What? Erwin's our leader. No, shut up! What? But number two, this is the now traumatized flock who will begin to worship any strong leadership figure. He says that when he found Erwin, he thought about finishing him off then and there, but then realized that him dying would be getting off easy. And immediately, we see everyone's faces react to that statement because it's just cruel. Yeah, Erwin's plan was brutal, but everyone, flock most of all, that's why I call him a wannabe veteran, knew what they were signing up for. To say a fellow soldier dying would be the easy way out, and that he wishes to force him to keep going is not even borderline evil, it is just evil. In hindsight, it is very easy to see that Flock always flung into these extremes. But in terms of initial reactions, I don't think anyone really lingers on it that much, mostly because they are all shell-shocked. That said, let's break down what's going on with him. Firstly, Flock does not think for himself, he needs someone to follow. Be it Erwin or Eren in the final season, he is just a lackey who desperately requires affirmation of someone he perceives as stronger and more capable. After the events of Return to Shiganshina, he doesn't have any sort of inner self, inner philosophy. So the only thing that gives him this perception of being in control is that person he can follow. He was incredibly naive about what being a scout actually entails. So now that he has hit the hardest of brick walls and somehow survived, he can't help but almost worship the people above him. Numero 2, this is the perfect showcase of how that trauma already causes him to twist things into something horrible. Erwin miraculously survived, but the only thing Flock can think of is that he shouldn't be getting off that easy. It is about vengeance, even against his own allies. And personally, I think it's in seeing these extreme beliefs that Levi begins to reconsider his decision. More on that in a second. And numero three, to loop back to that point of him needing someone to guide him, note just how quickly Flock swings right to the most extreme conclusion of needing this single chosen devil to make the world burn and defeat all of their enemies. Someone who will throw away countless lives if it means scoring just one important victory. Flock's mind has just cracked, and he truly believes that he is some chosen hero whose destiny is to bring justice to the world, be it under Erwin or Aaron. Well, in reality, all he did was duck and get lucky. That's it. He is not some chosen one, and he was never meant to do anything. Just like Erwin and just like Armin, all he did was get lucky. In a small scene I absolutely love here is Flock stepping toward Mikasa only for her to immediately turn to him ready to slice and dice at a moment's notice. Levi's decision is obviously what gets the spotlight in this episode. But I absolutely love how quickly he drops the entire argument and tries to stop Mikasa from bloodying her hands. Remember that Levi's entire life motto is no regrets. Just like he didn't tell Eren what to do during the Annie mission, the same thing should hold here, right? If Mikasa can overpower him and get the injection to Armin, well then, it is what it is. Except that statement is no longer as absolute as it might have been before. Levi does care for them, so again, as much as the injection is the single most important thing here, Levi still just tries to make sure that their entire squad doesn't implode. The reason I bring this up is because I think a lot of people try to paint Levi in this episode as only capable of one thought at a time. Whereas in reality, and we'll see this in a second, he is the most divided of anyone here and it's not even close. I don't know why, but so many people keep saying that like the only thing on his mind throughout this entire episode is just Erwin and to me that is a bit silly. Before we get to that though, we get another beautiful scene of Hanji just muttering, I don't believe it. The dub actually swaps it out for, It isn't fair. Which personally, I think is an even stronger line because, yeah, this is not fair, like, at all. As Levi grabs the injection again, Mikasa just screams as tears flow down her face. Similar to what Levi said, Hanji too says they can't let people's hopes within the walls die with Erwin, only for Mikasa to scream that they could say the same thing for Armin. Hanji does admit that he is exceptional, but that Erwin has experience. Again, this is just all of those Erwin-Armin parallels exploding in spectacular fashion. 
everyone knows that this is a choice with no victors. Though Hanji then finally drops the whole rational argumentation and just says they've lost hundreds of people that they'd want to bring back. Drop your Fs in the chat for Moblit, by the way, he was truly the GOAT. But Hanji then just says, even now, accepting it, it's impossible. It's painful. Really painful. But we have to keep moving forward. And there's that line yet again. The line that beautifully encapsulates the undying spirit of humanity, but also the blind hatred and victory at any cost mindset we see in the final season. The line that comes from his dear friend Armin, who never ran away, and the same line that comes from his direct opposite Reiner. But okay, more on Aaron's favorite catchphrase in season 4. This is Mikas' breaking point, and I think after hearing what Flock throughouts about living on as these demons, she is finally ready to just let Armin rest. I've seen some people say, including the man with the world's worst hair, like, oh my god, I hate it so much, I'm gonna go off the script real quick, you have no idea how much his hair annoys me, I can't even come up with nicknames for him, it's just so bad. But yeah, a lot of people say that, apparently, Mikasa didn't fight like hard enough for Armin or something along those lines. Personally though, I think that is ridiculous. Without a second's thoughts, she drew her sword at Levi, almost cut down Flock. And even after tanking Shrapnel from the Thunder Spears and fighting off two Titan Shifters, she still just screams and fights back against Hanji. Just like we saw with Eren, way back in episode 6 and 7, she simply chooses to let him rest, but keep living on for him. Like we talked about earlier, without Armin, I mean, Eren would fall apart. He would need Mikasa, like, really, really bad. I think for most people, the appeal of this alternate scenario is just seeing what Erwin would do. I'm not gonna lie though, I am much much more curious about what would happen to Eren. Trying to picture Eren learning about the outside world after losing Armin and being devastated, I mean, it would have to be like infinitely worse than what we actually see in Season 4, right? And I guess speaking of, Eren on the other hand just refuses to stay down. He grabs Levi's ankle and just asks, do you know what the ocean is? And after recounting Armin's story, finishing with, I'd forgotten all those dreams we shared as kids. I wanted to avenge my mom by killing all the titans. That hatred was the only thing fueling me. But he isn't like that. Armin doesn't care about fighting, he has bigger dreams. This is again that duality within Eren that we see throughout this entire story. There is so so much hatred, but there is also that tiny flicker of hope. And again, without Armin, I can't imagine season 4. And that brief focus on Levi's eyes squinting ever so slightly. The weight he is carrying is downright insane because the person Aaron just described is beat for beat, him and Erwin. Levi is the little Beyblade man whose objective was always just to cut down anything in his way. Erwin was the one that always seemed to operate on this entirely different plane of existence with goals beyond anyone's understanding. That is Armin, someone whose desire is a totally selfless goal of just reaching the sea. But even so, Levi stands up, announcing that he is feeding Bertolt to Erwin. Those brief scenes we get of everyone just trying to cope with that loss are absolutely heart-wrenching. Connie just mumbling, goodbye. Jean barely even comprehending what's going on. Erwin quite literally being carried away. It's just, I keep saying this, even on like a 30th rewatch, it's just the big oof. And so, Levi is finally left alone with his thoughts. The very moment everyone leaves, his mind snaps right back to that conversation of Armin he overheard in episode 49. The same conversation he'd return to over and over and over, right up until he'd bring down Zeke in the series finale. And what I absolutely love here are those gently falling specks of ash, which, just like the title of Midnight Sun, even further creates this almost paradoxical scene. Because it looks like snow, doesn't it? It's this weird surreal scene of the world itself almost freezing over despite the summer sun. This decision, someone will die at Levi's hand, one of his own allies. This world is just cold. We see Levi wandering through memories, then angrily saying that they're all the same, all chasing some stupid dream. But mere moments before the needle hits Erwin's arm, he again remembers Armin, and a moment later, Erwin's hand shoots up, with us seeing just a few fleeting frames of the classroom. Erwin just mutters, how can we be sure that there are no people beyond the walls? Now, big warning, apparently this might be like the most single controversial interpretation of a scene I've ever had. But after many many rewatches, my perspective has shifted from Levi just choosing to let Erwin rest, 
to a slightly more nuanced decision of not killing Armin's dream. The moment of shock we see in Levi's eyes as Erwin mutters that same question that has been rattling around his brain for decades, I believe, is him seeing one unimaginable torment because, again, it's been decades, the same question over and over, but two, being disappointed. His mind shoots back to Erwin's final moments, Kenny's final moments, and finally Armin. All slaves to some grand dream, all throwing everything away for some grander cause. But not all are created equal, because only one is truly selfless. In Levi's own words, only one has that same look in his eyes that Erwin once had. He does not regret entrusting the future in his hands. This is the reason why I kept yapping on about episode 49 and the exchange we saw there. Erwin is a shell of his former self. That light, that spark, it left his eyes in the season 2 finale. He did confirm his father's hypothesis. He never learned what's in the basements or the true history of the walls, but he fulfilled that selfish desire to just know that he was right. Like we saw in episode 49, Levi knows that there is just not a lot left in Erwin. And then there is what Flock said. Levi told Erwin to give up on his dream and die, and in the face of that impossible weight, Erwin simply thanked Levi. To bring him back into this hell, to push him even further when he himself said that he doesn't know what he'd do after learning of what hides in the basements, it's just cruel and it's vengeance. To let Erwin pass away, still in that classroom, still wondering about whether or not it was indeed right, it's mercy. That dream, it never died. In his final moments, he was there, talking to his father, wondering about whether or not there is more out there. And then on the opposite side, there is Armin and his dream of seeing the ocean, of exploring the outside world and everything it has to offer. The dream that has burrowed in his brain ever since that tiny conversation he overheard. The dream that keeps playing in his mind, regardless of how much he tells himself that he has made his choice to save Erwin. So yes, in my mind, Levi was absolutely ready to pick Armin. I think there's a reason why we get these two very explicit scenes of not seeing Levi's eyes, where one is hearing that Erwin puts the basement over humanity's victory, and the other is this. Levi is reminded that no matter what happens after the basement, Erwin will be a shell of his former self. For Armin, on the other hand, the sea, it's just the beginning. I think Levi always knew that the one whose dream could not die no matter what, and the person they truly needed was Armin. All that was necessary was for someone to just push his hand in the right direction, just like it had so many times before. So yes, he does wish to let Erwin just finally rest, but he also refuses to kill that light in Armin's eyes. He will never replace Erwin, that much everyone can agree on, including himself. But the light, the wonder, and the hope in his eyes is something that not even Erwin could replace. And so, when we get to Flock asking Levi why he chose Armin, he just asks whether he could ever forgive Erwin, saying he never wanted to be the devil. It's them that forced him into one. We've talked plenty throughout the series about this idea of sacrificing your own humanity and becoming a monster to fight back the monsters. We began this season with Armin bloodying his hands to protect his allies. All of them have been forced into doing things that they never wanted to do, that are cruel. Some are completely absorbed by that violence and vengeance. Others can look past that violence and still see the purity in this world. But just a select few can truly embody that brutality and bleakness of the world. To never look away, even from the most cruel outcome imaginable, but never lose themselves in that. Erwin is one of those select few. He did the worst kinds of things, sacrificed countless lives, but even standing on that mountain of corpses, mere minutes away from fulfilling that selfish dream, he laid down his own life, just like everyone that came before. He added himself to that mountain of corpses. Flock sought to punish him, to make him continue to fight for all the blame he had amassed. While in reality, Erwin had more than punished himself as is, carrying that weight for so long that, well, he just couldn't anymore, plain and simple. And that scene of Levi mentioning his promise again, only for Hanji to say that he's already dead, that is just diabolical, but unfortunately, all too familiar for Levi. Not once has he gotten to just properly say goodbye. Be it Isabel or Petra or very recently Kenny, there is just never enough time to actually say what he wishes to say. Well, 
I guess that's actually kind of a lie, because he will get enough time to say goodbye, but sadly, just once. And with us then cutting to Armin just being reborn, with the Titan markings by the way, man, this episode is just a masterclass in direction. Everything from breaking the conventions we'd grown to expect with the series, to just having two tracks in the entire episode, to the way we constantly yo-yo back and forth in Levi's mind, it's just perfect. And even taking a step back from that, the way Armin's survival is revealed through what is clearly his titan grabbing the screaming bathwater, 10 out of 10 no notes. But okay, this episode has been very depressing, so one goofy side note that one of you might be able to enlighten me on. In episode 5 or something, I mentioned the scene of Armin coming out of the Titan and being absolutely ripped. To be honest with you, I have absolutely no idea how I landed on this conclusion, maybe it's the fact that Armin's back looks, well, pretty rough, or something else, but I always assumed that Armin was nowhere near this chiseled before becoming a Titan, and that it's rather his body being rebuilt within the paths that makes him a Giga Chad. But at the same time, he is a soldier, so it does kind of make perfect sense that he'd also have an extremely strong core. So maybe it's like his lanky stature that made me, falsely, very sorry for not noticing your mad gains, Armin, think he wasn't ripped before? Well, I've got no idea, I'm just curious if anyone else had the same assumption as me. For some reason, I thought Emir was just making everyone Giga Chads in the paths, I don't know. But on that note, that is episode 55. Not really much to add here aside from, and I say this with no reservations whatsoever, I think this is a perfect episode of television, it is perfect drama. The only thing you could say is, again, Armin surviving the fall in the first place, so maybe it's not like a 10 out of 10, but it's like a 9.9. .9. It is a perfect episode. I know IMDB is like a useless hellhole where people are either blindly rating everything 10 out of 10 or 1 out of 10. It's like the best thing or worst thing ever and there is nothing in between. Uh, I still went on there though and uh, yeah, everyone's just crying about, you know, Armin surviving. Um, like I said, I can nitpick the whole him surviving in the first place, but they're just saying that it doesn't make any sense even though, you know, it's like the whole point of the story and Levi literally spells it out. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, I hope I'm not going to get any of those comments. Don't. Don't. I mean, yeah, like I said, this episode is perfect drama. There is little to no action, little to no explosive moments. It has, like, no music. It is just people. And isn't that what, like, fiction is supposed to be? A story about people just dressed up in a, you know, fantasy universe? Perfect. But alright, I've been yapping on for long enough because, um, Isayama keeps on cooking. And next time, well, it's time to see the climax of this entire series thus far. So, I hope to see you back as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. I have nothing to add, I just spent like 45 minutes talking about people on a rooftop. Yes, that's how good this show is. I don't even know how this happened to be honest with you, but I guess here we are. But anyway, all of my other channels and socials are in the description, and with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Legatith, I think, and Milan Vinci, I think. I am so sorry if I butcher the name. But without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.